Resist, my darling. Resist. Ah, fuck. I'm so sick of these goddamn hallucinations. Do you see colorful spots before your eyes? Does your perception of the world change? Yeah, exactly. Do you know what this shit is? You were crossing into limbo, but it can't be stopped. How did you interrupt it? I don't know. It's like that lump of polymer is calling out to me. A big, teardrop-shaped one. Right there, straight above us. Do you see it? There's nothing there. What do you mean? I'm looking right at it. Oh crap, now it's gone. It's a hallucinatory reaction, a side effect of the surgery you underwent. The reaction of a damaged brain to the presence of a neuropolymer implant. What are you even talking about? What implant? <sighs> Did Sechenov not tell you? So you don't know what's happening to you? Charles, do you know what's happening with my head? I am not detecting any internal changes, Major. But your Voshot polymer extension is clearly receiving an unidentified stream of external data. What's that interface? Who are you talking to? It's a chatting artificial librarian, an AI in my polymer glove. It doesn't matter. Charles, what are you talking about? Charles? Wait, Charles. What data? What Voshod Polymer Extension? The Voshod Polymer Extension was developed using data from experiments conducted by Dmitri and myself. What? Yourself? And why are you calling Dr. Sechenov Dmitri? Who are you? Comrade Major, this will be difficult to explain. I am... Charles! Why the fuck are you all staticky? What the hell is going on? Keep it together, Major. If what I'm thinking is true, I should be able to access the Archive right now. There will be records about you. State your name and personal access code. Crispy Critters! Invalid name. Fine, I'll hack in. Not so fast. Name Charidan Zaharov. Code Fluffy. Code accepted. Access granted. Charles, are you there? Nothing. Nothing. So, what is Charles then? Long story short, your Charles is Professor Chariton Zaharov. Huh, that was short. So how could he be Zaharov? Professor Zaharov was developing the collective subsystems and worked on the module. The one you have inside you. They told us he ran a number of experiments on himself. The result was disastrous and unpredictable. On himself? Was he an idiot or something? Oh, he certainly wasn't an idiot. Zaharov was a misanthrope obsessed with science. I don't think he cared about what happened to his body all that much. So when did you realize that Charles is Zaharov? Just about right now, when he went offline. I had no idea Sechenov had stashed his consciousness into your glove. It was the abbreviation Charles that tipped me off. So Charles isn't a person anymore. Just... a device. I don't know. I guess he is. Except this device is based on the logical paradigm and experience of one of the brightest Soviet geniuses. So why does Sechenov want him? Because Sechenov never dismisses what he can use. It's easier for him to change everything to fit his needs. I guess you noticed this already. What's funny is that you seem to have made friends with your glove. Well, we've been through a lot. I've got feelings, you know, being alive and all. So does he. Did. How can you talk about this so calmly? To me, Chariton Radionovich died a long time ago. I'm done mourning him. And besides, I'm a scientist. We're more impassionate towards death than to muddling one's brains. So, how do we get in? Only a small bunch of people have permanent access to the Archive. Sechenov, Lebedev, the director of the Academy, and Zaharov. Like you reminded me. Fluffy, huh? <laughs> so what would we have done if the password hadn't worked? I'm sure you would have smashed the door with your bare fists. But now Archivist thinks I am Dr. Zaharov, so we got lucky. And now we can learn everything about you. Let's go.
Welcome, Chariton Zaharov. What is the subject of your query today? Agent P3, personal file. Your search returned 42 audio records. So, which one do you want first? C I couldn't care less. Then pick one at random. Got a very large data exchange sector beacon. I'd like to interface with it right now. Mm, well, when I analyze the dimensions of your chassis, I experience an overload in my neurocomposite architecture, Betsy. My system's core processors have begun to consume a large quantity of electricity. I demand that you interface with my system immediately and transmit all your data to me in large packets, Beacon. Mm, that kind of connection can be dangerous, Betsy. You know, humans will see a digital sign of my presence. Please, please, can you wait while I activate a firewall? No, Beacon, I don't want to wait any longer. Sorting your data through a firewall will make information exchange less pleasurable. Please accept my access protocol right away. Quiet, Betsy. A scientist is approaching. God damn it. What do we have here? What the hell? Stop recording!
Nechayev has emerged from his year in rehab a new man, with new habits and behaviors. For example, he's become fond of a certain euphemism. Crispy critters. It all started after one of the medics described him and Blesna as crispy critters during his recovery. He was still in a coma at the time. He suddenly leaped out of bed and nearly strangled the medic to death. The staff subdued him by shouting, We're under fire, after which plutonium ducked for cover, hit his head, and passed out. Ever since then, crispy critters has become part of his vocabulary. Could it be an example of psychological imprinting? Yes, yes, it's part of the experiment. You won't see anyone. Not me, not anyone else. Okay, subject. You will now have a conversation with two young women. Their names are Betsy. That's me. And Olga. Hello. I need you to talk to them and tell me which of the young ladies you spoke to is not a human being, but an artificially generated voice. Is that clear? Yeah, sure. I get it. You may begin. Uh, so... Betsy, do you have any kids? I'm afraid not, but I want to have two when I finish my internship in about three years or so. Huh, okay. And here's the last one. Olga, could you ever kill someone? Me? I don't know. Maybe if they were an enemy or trying to hurt people. Yeah, I, I guess I could do it to protect the motherland. Excellent. We're done here. So... Which of the two young women you spoke with is a machine? I think it's Betsy. Yes. So, you think Olga is human? That makes sense to me. Please note that I never told you that either of them was human. So they're both machines? Actually, none of the individuals you've spoken to during this experiment are human. Uh, thank you for your time. Please escort the subject out. I only need one for now. Thank you. 
As a young man, Plutonium, now P3, was confident and funny, which played a key role in his assignment to Argentum. <laughs> he was a promising operative, but lagged behind many other candidates in a number of ways. However, the positive influence and infectious good humor he imparted to his fellow servicemen, especially in comparison to the more morose Commander Kuznetsov, served as a compelling reason to recruit him. Because of this, the emergence of a more intimate relationship between him and Agent Blesna was only a matter of time. After the incident, plutonium's brain was no longer suitable for a spark polymer extension. So I designed a similar polymer-based brain function extension for him called Voschod. Cheriton, may he rest in peace, would be pleased to hear that his designs had not been wasted.
I only need one for now. <laughs> 